<laughs> I've only got two kids, so I can't answer the question. Now, who's got a dozen kids here? Half a dozen? Is it cheaper by the dozen? It is. It is? <laughs> it is. All right. Uh, increasing your net worth. Now, we all, have, um, we all understand cash flow, I guess, to some extent. We can be in a deficit position, in debt. Sometimes we do need to go into debt. Sometimes there's bad debt. Yep. Uh, there's a break-even position or a surplus position. Isn't that simple? Okay, finance is not complicated. It is really quite simple. <laughs> but maybe doing it is more difficult. Now, the issue is, in doing anything, it's discipline. You know, if you think we can do something and we're not disciplined, let me assure you, the result is not going to be what you're expecting. And we often don't appreciate the, the background to Bible study, regular you know, meditation and prayer. That gives us the framework for consistency and commitment now we don't see it like that, because we are too busy. And it really is a blessing, if you know what this does. And everything that God has set out in the Bible is for our benefit. It's not for His. But we don't see it, because you know, just even in the Garden of Eden, the issue was Adam and Eve wanted to do it their way. Right? Not God's way. So, uh, if I could leave this... Um, thought with you, just think about that a bit more. When you study your Bible and meditate on things, remember that this is for your benefit, not his. Okay, so I'm sure people are in all of these positions, and sometimes we will be in, in a deficit position, but we need to have a plan to get out of there. Often we are in a position, but we don't have a plan, so we continue in that cycle. That is your risk. Okay? Now, anyone has any questions on this? No? Okay. Okay, building wealth. We need to generate income. How many of you are generating an income? Let me just see your hands. I should see everyone's hand going up. Because we are all generating an income. Whether it's, whether we're in private practice, a job, on the pension, it doesn't matter what we are, we are receiving an income. Okay? There are different levels of income. Um, finance patterns. How do we manage the money we have? Uh, some people go into debt, they want to go on a trip and they buy it on their credit card. Do we understand, if we are in this sort of spending mode, what that implication is? So if you buy something on credit and it takes you two years to pay it off, you can be paying 30% more for your trip. So think about what we want with money and whether it's for, it's for instant self-gratification. One of the things that we have realized in recent years is the most successful people are not people with the highest IQ, but people with the highest EQ. And EQ is the intelligence quotient, not, uh, not intelligence quotient, but emotional quotient. Okay, if we can manage our emotions, we are going to be much more success successful than having intelligence and even knowledge. Because we don't put knowledge into practice unless our emotions go behind it. So think about that. If you've got kids, train them, train their emotional quotient, because you can. Okay? Um, repayment of debt. Often people have debt and don't know what they should do about it. How should we repay debt? So I'll come to that. Compounding is interest we mentioned earlier. Investing. We need to always invest some money. If you don't invest it, we're getting into a bad habit of not investing, living for the moment. And finance, uh, finance planning or financial planning. So let's look at income earning strategies. The most common strategy is trading time for money. Yeah, we, most of us do that. We trade our time for money. 
So when people work long hours, they get overtime, but it's trading time for money. Um, the next one is investing to earn money. And that's why it's important to save some money to invest. Now, some countries save a lot more than other countries. And uh, the research is showing, showing that some countries don't have um, the same number of words that other countries or other languages have for saving. And the countries that don't have a, a lot of words or abundance of words for saving actually save less. Because the language actually doesn't help them save. A great strategy, multiply your time through the efforts of others. Have a business or something else like that. It's not always easy to get there. So most of us are in the common strategy, trading time for money. So how do we make more money by trading our time for money? I think that's the most effective thing. I can go through all of the other stuff, but maybe that's not useful. Now let's talk about compounding interest, okay? Just to give you an example here, let's assume you have $10,000 and your rate of interest is 10%. I know that's high, but it's easy to calculate, okay? So, and what I'm trying to show you here is, if you get the interest payment on an annual basis or a monthly basis, so you can ask uh, the institution, are you going to pay me annually, quarterly, or monthly? So just look at the difference. Um, $10,000, 10% a year, and the first column is if it's paid annually, that's this one here, and if it's paid, it's paid monthly, it's the next column. So you don't have to do anything just the impact of the bank putting money in or whoever putting money into your account on a monthly basis gives you a lot more income over time and you don't even do anything. So one of the questions to ask is, am I getting a return on a monthly, weekly, quarterly or yearly basis? And get it done as frequently as it can because you're going to make more money doing nothing. Okay? Uh, the other example is, again, $10,000, we just take a term of 20 years, but this is having different rates of interest. So we start with 5%, 10, 15, and 20%. So just have a look, just look at the, the end column. At 5%, 10,000 over, um, uh, over, over 20 years, 5% uh, 5 a year, you get $21,000. But over 20 years, you get $195,000. So the point there is, the higher the rate of interest, you get a, a whole lot more money at the end. Now when you say, get a higher rate of interest, more interest means more risk. Very few people are going to give you more, a higher rate of interest without increasing the risk that you carry. So there's a balance between getting a higher rate of interest and the risk you take. But it's clear the higher rate of interest you can make makes a significant difference to the amount of money you would accumulate. And just look at over time, five years versus 20 years. So this is the whole issue about time or compounding, the compounding effect of time. Uh, it's staggering, for $10,000 over 20 years, say 20%, you have almost $200,000, one investment of $10,000. That's it, you don't put any more money in. Isn't that staggering? Now I'm not trying to say you can get 20%, but even if you work on 10%, it's what, 40, almost $45,000 by doing nothing from 10,000. Now I'm not saying go and park your money in the bank. I'm not suggesting that at all because I don't think that's a good option. There are better options. But if you understand the impact of keeping money working for you, especially if you're younger, uh, it will really reap rewards in the end. You know, people don't ever have to retire without money if they understand and plan ahead of time. Okay, how do you build wealth? Again, it's not rocket science, it's three ways. Three ways only. Okay? Nothing new about this. Property, fixed interests or securities, and equities. So property, everyone knows about property, you probably live in a house. Okay, so we're talking property here. Uh, fixed interest securities, it can be interest in the bank, bonds, those sort of instruments. And equities are what you would buy on the share market. 
you all have heard of shares, BHP or Woodside or Commonwealth Bank. Yep, those are the only three ways. So nothing, there's no mystery here. It's how we execute it that makes the difference. Okay? Now, you might say, oh, well, some things are more secure than others. Property never goes down. Depends where you live. You know, in the United States, some properties went down 50% or more. Now, the thing that drives property prices or keeps property prices high is there are more people coming in than leaving. For example, in Australia, if we stopped immigration tomorrow, you'd have a property problem. Because the demand is going to dry up. Because there's an insatiable demand for property, because we've got over 100,000 people coming in every year into Australia, the demand is high. Okay? And that's, one of, that's probably one of the biggest drivers. Interest rates, yes, but if immigration stopped, so pray for immigration to continue. <laughs> if immigration stopped, then you'd be in trouble. And as a you, property will be in a, in a, that'd be a real issue. If you look at the distribution of property, capital cities is where the people go. That's where the prices are high. The prices around here have not gone up. There's no demand. So look, when you want to buy things, look where you're going to buy. See whether there's demand and buy in a place where there's demand. But by all means, buy in a, in a holiday area if you want to use it for a holiday house. If you want to enjoy the environment, buy it. Remember, don't restrict yourself to making money. That's the, not the only thing on this planet. You must enjoy your life along the way. Okay? Uh, but that's, the, that's how it works. So very simple. So how would you get into property? Often property has a high initial threshold to get in because you need to have a deposit. Yep. Uh, fixed interest, you can all do that because if you've got some cash, you put it in an account and keep it there till you build up what you need to buy property or buy shares. Now, equities are much easier to get into. You don't need a lot of money to get into them, but you need a little bit more information or you can go to a broker. You pay the broker a fee, sometimes it's $20 up to about $35 to get his advice and he will place the trade for you. So you don't need to do anything. But today with technology, you can do it all on your computer. But please don't go and try to do it without getting education. Okay? <laughs> you can lose your money quite easily by not knowing what to do. But what I'm trying to say is equities are very, very easy to get into because you can do it at home on your computer. And when I say equities, you can buy shares. Uh, another huge area is currency. Now you realize that in the last few months the Australian dollar has dropped. You can buy and sell currency, again very risky. Now let me give you a bit of a handle on this. Out of all the equities and currencies, uh, the least risky is to buy shares. Buy the share and sell the share or whatever you want to do. Uh, when you go into currencies, it's leveraged. Now how many of you know what leverage means? Yeah? Okay, tell us what you think leverage is. Oh, oh I'll, give, I'll give you my version and you can give me your feedback. When you go to buy, uh, okay, I'll use, you, I'll use a house as an example. Most people would put 20% in for a house deposit and they'll borrow the, borrow the rest from the government or from the bank, okay? So you're leveraged four times, yeah? Because you borrow, you borrow four times what you put in. So that's, you're leveraged four times. You don't realize what you're doing, but that's what you're doing. But because the house prices have remained stable, you don't see that as a risk. Okay, you're personally, you've got to live in the house, you could live somewhere, and you're willing to take that leverage. Now, people will lend you with 5% deposit. So if they lend you with 5% deposit, you're leveraged, what, almost 20 times. But again, when you talk about houses, you don't think about that. Yeah? So it's the same thing with shares. You can leverage. You can put in 20% and borrow the rest. But when you go to currencies, you can leverage it 100 times or more. So what leverage means is you can make big profits. 
Okay? And you can make big losses. Okay? So that's why lots of people get into equities and it's a it's a minefield if you don't get the right education. But if you if you have some extra money and you want to try things, get some education and try it because it's exciting. Because of technology. You can do it at home. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, you couldn't do that at home. You had to go to a broker. These days you can do exactly what a broker does at home. Okay? So that's the three different ways to, to building wealth. Um, now, uh, let me go back to property again. Even with property, you need to get the, the most you can get from the piece of land. Uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, an average block of land was what? Seven, eight hundred square meters? Thousand square meters? Today, in Sydney, the new blocks of land are 300 and less. Okay? So when you buy property, you can actually get some extra value by finding out what you can do with that land. So people often knock a house down and put, put two houses on, subdivide it, or do other things. So if you want to ask me specific questions on property, just ask. I'm happy to answer, but I'm just giving you an overarching view here. Okay? So those are the only three ways. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure, I, I, you'll have to give me the quote, I'm not sure, but let me answer that question in another way. That's why I've spent some time on shares, because yes, you can make money and you can lose money easily. Right? So you need to know what you're doing. Now, uh, buying shares doesn't have to be a gamble. It is a gamble to most people. Let me give you a bit of an insight here. Why do you think we take people to court for insider trading? It's crazy. <laughs> it's cheating? Why is it cheating? But no, it's allowed in some places. But it used to be allowed here, I believe. Well, insider trading is never allowed. And why isn't it allowed? What is insider trading, anyhow? Anyone? Yeah. It's gaining information before it's public knowledge. Okay, so, it, it's, that is correct. So an insider trader is someone who is inside the company, like the CEO, or the financial accountant, or whoever he is, senior people who know what's happening in the company. So if they know, for example, they're going to have a huge deal coming up, and they use that information to buy shares, because if a huge deal takes place, the share price usually goes up. So because they have information that others don't have, that will be classed as insider trading. So they can't actually buy the shares. So when you ask the question, if you have information that others don't have, it's not a risk, <laughs> okay? But it's not legal. So the other way is to actually find out as much information as you can about a company. Now there are people who just specialize on research and you can buy this information. But I'm not trying to advocate go down that path, okay? I've, I've traded for what, 15 years? And I can tell you it's not an easy path, okay? So any other questions? And okay, the other thing is, if you're greedy, it's going to be a difficult path. Especially if you're trading. Because if you're greedy, you see the signals to say sell, but you're hoping it's going to go high. So you need to have a different psychology when you're doing this sort of stuff. I'm spending a bit of time because these are the only ways you can do it, and if you understand the risks in all of them, you can do it differently, okay? You don't have to get trapped. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yeah. Um, you just quite like to mention the uh, dividend, um, putting through dividends, because there's such a big dividend rich investor if you buy shares and have putting through dividends. Yeah. Thank you. So there are two things here. Thank you for raising that point. I'm glad you're raising the point because then I can answer the question. When you buy shares, uh, not every company, but a lot of companies, if not most companies, pay dividends. Like if you put your money in the bank, you get a dividend from the bank, right? That's called interest. So most companies will pay a dividend. Some are 1%, 2%, some are 10%. Okay? 
and also the um, it's what uh, it's what you said. Um, I can't. Sorry, your franking credits, but some of these, uh, the dividends you get, uh, the interest, the tax has already been paid. So when you get some money, say, if you get some money from the bank, you have to pay, you have to pay a tax on the interest because it's not a franked dividend. But in some companies, they pay you a fully franked dividend, so when you get the money, it's yours to keep. And in some cases, depending on your tax threshold, you can get some money back because that has already been paid and you have deductions to make. So there's an advantage in, in investing in some companies. Okay? But talk to someone who really can help you with that. So some people live on the income by investing money in the companies that pay high dividends and fully, fully frank dividends. Okay, so it's a really easy way to go because most, if you invest properly, you can do well, you can do much better than the banks can do. But you need to know what you're doing. Okay? Yeah. I am not aware of that. Has any? I, I mean, they used to have some of those. I think Wilma, you had some ICF. ACF, but I don't know if they still operate. Yes, there are, there are tools like that. You know, that's a good example where you gift your property to the church, for example. But they pay you an annuity. So it's like a pension for you to live on. But they, you agree with them what the return is. Now, other people do that too. You have that in the private sector as well. So you can research and do it. But I don't know about the church here in Australia doing that. Yeah. Um, any other question? No? Okay, we'll keep going. Ask questions at any time. Now, some other thoughts that um, I think are worth thinking about, okay? Some other, other, uh, some other um, concepts. You know, we, we often hear about tithing. Now, I'm not here, I'm not here to, to preach about tithing, but let me give you a concept of what tithing is about. Most people, live their life, and at the, at the end of the month, there's more days left than dollars. Right? We don't have enough money to go around. So we are thinking our mindset is in deficit. We don't have enough money. And it doesn't matter how much you earn, we often don't have enough money. So how do we change that mindset? You know, when God set up the, con the, 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 the concept of tithing, it's to give us that concept. Because if we can donate 10% or give back to God 10%, we are already in an abundance attitude because we have had money to, to give back to God the 10% that he says it's his. In fact, all the money is his. He's only asking for 10%. So doing that first, sets your mindset in a different place. You have sufficient and abundance in your life. That's really what it's about. It's not about the tithes. God doesn't want your money. Okay, just think about it. Because the more we try to pull back and control things and manage things and manage our money and get more money, what are we doing? We're doing things on our own power. That's weak compared to his power. Okay, so just a thought there. Pay yourself, because part of your earnings is yours to keep. Uh, I suggest to people 10% for financial independence. In other words, save that money and never use that. Use it for investments or other things. Because if you don't have a habit of saving and investing, how are you going to grow your money? Okay, 
The other thing is 10 to 20 percent for debt cl debt clearance. If you have any debts, get rid of it. So maybe only five on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> don't pay them at all if you don't have to. Yeah, good point. I should have taken that out. Pay them on Tuesday or Friday doesn't matter. But pay your debts back. Now, how do you do? You know how to pay your debts back? What's the quickest way to reduce your debts? Say you got a bank card, a car loan. No, some other loan, a housing loan, what would you pay off first? Consolidate, put it all in one line. Consolidate it, put it all in one loan? And then have your what you bank in that, in that account. That's one option, is to consolidate them. Very good, yes. Any other things you might do if you don't want to consolidate them? With the risk interest rate, the smallest amount first? Yep. No, no, pay the, pay the, you're right, pay the smallest amount first. Usually it's on our bank cards, but pay the smallest amount first. Or the way to say is you've got to balance that with the highest rate of interest you pay. Generally speaking, your bank cards have the highest interest. Pay the smallest one off first, but pay all of that amount that you pay off on that first payment on the second one. So don't take the money and use it for something else. Use it to pay off the second one, and then all the payments you're using on that, pay the third one. So escalate them on, as you go up. Okay, so that's the easiest way, yeah. There's also um, things like um, good debt and bad debt. Correct. So buy the bad one first, which is cards and credit cards and so on, and keep the good debt, which might increase the value of your asset okay. or house, that will be the last debt that you pay. Okay, so let's get, thank you, say a bit more. In fact, you don't need to pay, just pay the interest on the debt if you don't have money to pay because the asset will grow. Okay, so the big issue is there is good debt and bad debt. Did you hear what good debt was or what bad debt was? Can anyone tell me what bad debt is? High interest. Sorry? High interest rate. High interest rate? Finance companies. Sorry? Finance companies. Finance companies, okay. <laughs> Fantastic, who said that? Oh, there, I will go. <laughs> If, if anything is depreciating, give me an example of a depreciating item. Car. A car. I love that. Don't go and buy a, buy a Ferrari. It's of no use to you. All right? You can't drive it at full speed on our roads in here. So that's a depreciating asset. A car is a great example. Give me another example. Sorry? A boat? Who said a boat? Absolutely, so it just sucks your money, doesn't it? Anything that depreciates in value is a bad asset. Don't get into that. Of course, you've got to have a car. So balance whether you're going to spend 20000 or 50000 on a car. If you're a young person buying a very expensive car, you're going to spend so much money on this thing. I know a young girl who is 19. She went with her mother to buy a car, and she bought a ute, okay? A V8 Ute, because she liked it. And the guy said, you know, this is, has got all of this performance and looks good and sounds good. And she turned to the mother and said, do you think I should buy it? And she said, it's your money. You're working. And she's working in a bakery, okay? <laughs> and she bought it. And then she realized she had to pay insurance. And phew. And phew. <laughs> but the insurance is $3,500 a year. So guys, just look at what the asset is you're going to get into. Don't get into depreciating, asset, depreciating asset, assets. You might have to get something, but don't overspend. So give me an example of an appreciating asset. Sorry, a house? Primary residence, very good. Now why, what's the difference between a house and a primary residence? Okay, so did you get that? So if you have your own home, it can go up from you know, two hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars. When you sell it, you don't have to pay any tax on it. Okay, so get your first home. Uh, investment properties aren't always as bad as it seems because if you hold an investment property for more than twelve months, you pay capital gains on only half of what you gain. 